Well, good evening, everybody. This is meteorologist Andrew Panera with another episode of Climate Matters. So, this week, we're going to talk about something that we may be feeling, especially if you're in the Northeast U.S., which are the seasons. We have quite a big change of the seasons, especially over the last couple, uh, last week even. So we're going to talk about the seasons overall and a couple different definitions of why some people say a season is now and it's not actually the start of the season. And also then, why climate change it looks like may be affecting these seasons, especially the transitionary seasons. So first, just want to tweet this out, post this out, get this everywhere so anybody that wants to join can join on in. Uh, yes, uh, Twitter, my, uh, <laughs> changed my Twitter password, so that won't go out. But let me try and get a couple more people out here. So, uh, thank you guys for joining. Anybody that's joining already? So also, I just want to throw out a question to start. What is your favorite season? And especially a couple different areas in the world have different seasons, like in the Northeast U.S., we're in the mid-latitudes. We have the four seasons of summer, fall, winter, spring. All other areas don't have that. They really are start hot all the time and have a wet and a dry season. So there are only two seasons there. But I would definitely love to know what you guys have as a favorite season or a favorite temperature range. So let me get this out on here. There we go. Just got to share this over a couple of places. Also, I was trying to work on getting one of uh, my friends on. He, uh, He's got a pretty good YouTube following. He's got about 20,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. He's going to try and get him on today. It didn't work out. He's going to try and come on in a couple of future episodes, and we're going to talk about some different things with uh, what he thinks of all this climate change. So one more spot I want to get this out to. All right. Posted in a couple spots there. So, I want to start out just by talking about the seasons themselves and how that relates to something we talked a little bit about with uh, El Nino, La Nina. So, El Nino and La Nina, that had to deal with the winter that we just had. We had quite a bit of a stretch of some nor'easters that came through late in the winter. And that was kind of typical of an average winter that we would see in the Northeast. Now, a lot of people were saying that was reminiscent of some older times, maybe in the 70s and 80s kind of feel. That's because the climate pattern, which was El Nino and La Nina, neither was happening. It was a bit more neutral, which is kind of the way it was a few decades ago. So when we have El Nino, that means there's a specific area in the equator just off the coast of Ecuador there. That's when that area in the Pacific Ocean is very warm. And when that is very warm, that means we have an El Nino and that affects the Atlantic Ocean. Because remember, Mother Nature loves everywhere to have balance and equilibrium. So if it's one specific area is a little bit too warm, it tries to make that up by cooling it down another area. And a good way to cool down the environment is by making it very wet. Meaning in the winter in the Northeast or even in getting into Canada, if anybody's watching from Canada, that means snow. So cold, wet winter is kind of what we see a bit more with El Ninos, but we see a lot more precipitation, not necessarily as cold in this neutral phase. That's where we were. That's why even in was it February? We saw 80 degree weather. Unheard of. It broke records everywhere in New Jersey, at least. I know specifically at Newark Airport. That day had, it broke a high temperature record. It was the first time ever there was a recording of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which was 27 Celsius for anybody that's international and uh, looking into the Celsius system. 27 Celsius. That's pretty warm for February in a very cold climate. So, 
the seasons are kind of changing a little bit. And this is something that I'm going to be doing a little bit more research on as to are we seeing the four seasons that we typically see or are they actually changing? Now, in the very beginning of the show, in the intro, I was talking about the transitionary seasons, the transitional seasons. Those are spring that we're in right now and fall. Because you have the two extreme seasons, you have a very hot summer and you have a cold winter, and then you have this intermediate between those hot and colds, which are those transition seasons. And why do seasons even happen? That's a question I actually got not too long ago. So I had a little demo here. So I have a golf ball. This we're going to represent as our Earth. So I'm just going to draw on here an equator. Even though this is a bit more like um, a bit closer to a perfect sphere, even though the Earth is not completely round or like a ball, it's so called something called an oblate spheroid. So it's a little wonky trying to draw on top of the bumps there. And then we have our North Pole and our South Pole. So we got this set up. So we got the North Pole on the top, South Pole on the bottom. And this is going to represent where the Earth is tilted. So you can see the line a little bit right there where the equator is. So straight up and down is actually not where the Earth is. We are at about 22 and a half degrees tilted. And it depends on what time of the year. It's either away or, too f or facing the sun. So you can see that little angle of the tilt. I brought a sun. So here, if the Earth was not tilted at all, we would have the sun directly shining on one side of that Earth, while the other is a little bit darker. And as the Earth orbits around, this pretty much stays even. Now, that's not the case. We have the Earth tilted like this. So this is why and it's a little bit odd to think of the Earth orbit as an of not completely circled, it's a bit more oval, but in our winter, we're actually closer because in the northern hemisphere where I am right now, we're tilted away from the sun in the winter. But even though we're very close to the sun there, this spot right here that was really bright, that's the southern hemisphere summer. And that gets really, really hot. And remember, this angle actually doesn't change too much. So as we orbit around, so now this side, it's pretty equal on the top and the bottom. So when the sun is facing there, this is the equinoxes, or the equini, whatever the plural is there. So equal parts of sun in the northern and in the southern hemisphere. Then. We go here, which would be our summer. So now we are a bit further away. So we're here in the, the northern hemisphere, and that's getting a bit more sunlight. But it's not as intense as the summer in the southern hemisphere, because even though it's pointed straight there, let me try this side. Even though it's pointed straight there, right here in the northern hemisphere, the sun is further away. And when the sun's further away, its rays aren't as intense. So just to recap, the Earth, the equator, is not perfectly straight. It's tilted at about a 22 and a half degree angle. And then when we have the sun coming in this way, the southern hemisphere, right there, there's their summer. And the sun is closer. Then as it rotates around, Throughout the year, we have the equinoxes. So here, when sun comes in, it's going to get a bit of an equal spread between the northern and southern hemisphere, which is almost about where we are right now. We're a little bit past that uh, vernal equinox. I think it was called for the spring was vernal. The, so the spring equinox, we're a little bit past. So it's not exactly even anymore. Then as it keeps rotating, 
now the, the northern hemisphere is showing much brighter sun or more direct sunlight. But remember that sun is a bit further away. And when the sun is further away, it's not as intense. We still get pretty hot in the northern hemisphere in the summer, but not as hot as the southern hemisphere's summer. And that's pretty much what determines seasons. So the question is, what defines a season? That's kind of what determines the seasons, where the sun is. And remember, we have that balance and that equilibrium. That's what Mother Nature loves. So what defines a season? Well, it actually depends on who you ask. Meteorological seasons, more like calendar seasons, or the Gregorian, the Gregorian calendar is what we use. That tends to be something that's a bit more rigid, doesn't really change too much. <laughs> uh, yes, I got a bandage coming off. I got a big cut there. It's actually pretty much going, it got a uh, little cut still sticking out there. Cut going across there. Uh, I got a cut on my finger. I was not storm chasing at my other job. It was the, uh, the Apple store. It was, um, there could be hazard pay times, and uh, I got cut during work there. Even though it's a retail job, you could still have hazards. <laughs> so I had a pretty big cut. It's actually about like a five or six inch gash going across my elbow. And then I had another little cut that turned into a bruise on my uh, finger. So I got a little roughed up. It was a bit of an odd date. And this all happened today. <laughs> And also, my eyes are probably a little bit red just because we have springtime and we have with springtime allergies. So that's why I'm wearing glasses today. It was a little bit more comfortable. So I feel roughed up. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. But I can make up a story and we can go with, uh, yeah, I was storm chasing last week. We had some, pr we actually did have some pretty severe weather that uh, have some tornado outbreaks. So yeah, let's go with that. I was storm chasing. <laughs> But um, with the springtime that we're in right now, with the, especially with tornado season really happening right now, what defines the spring? We'll just focus on spring. Well, the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, and I just want to actually make sure I'm using it. If it's vernal, yeah, vernal. That changes a little bit. It's not the exact same day every single year. It could be March 21st, it could be March 22nd. It's not really set, and that's based on astronomy, the astronomical calendar. So with that, you have um, this little bit of a variance. And that doesn't really work well with climate records, and especially since this is a climate show, we're talking about climate records. The uh, climate records need very precise data. That's also why my own research I was doing, December 1st, was the day I took as the beginning of winter. because. December 1st is meteorolo meteorological winter, the start day. Spring, March 1st. March 1st starts meteorological winter. It doesn't start our typical calendar based on astronomy, but we needed these hard set days. So March 1st through May 29th or 30th, depending on which meteorolo meteorologist you ask, but essentially June 1st, starts summer. December 1st starts winter and October 1st starts fall. That's what makes the climate records much easier to deal with if we have these hard days on the first of the month and that's kind of what we feel like anyway because if we're December 15th it's getting near the holiday it's pretty much right before the holidays it's cold there's, there may be snow on the ground. Technically, it's still fall for December 15th. However, in our minds, we mentally think of this as winter already. Same thing now, we're in May. We kind of get that springtime feel, but at the end of May, going into June, so say June, June 15th. June 15th, we can have a 90 or 100 degree day. I think that is summer. It feels like summer, it's 100 degrees, it's June, even though technically it's not. And I just wanna see what day specifically 
summer is this year. Wow, my old physics uh, textbook came up for some reason. Let's see here. I know a lot of people are probably also counting down how many days until summer after this decently rough winter we had in the uh, lower 48 there. So it's the 21st. It, there's all these counters out there. Summer 2018, Thursday, June 21st, 2018, 6.08 a.m. Now, maybe a little bit difficult to see, but 6.08 a.m., let me see if I can move that down a little bit here. That's important because that has to deal a bit more with the position of the moons and the position, the position of the moon and the position of the sun. So that's where we have these differences in the definition of seasons. So June 21st, or uh, sorry, yeah, June 21st, Thursday, 6 to 8 a.m. starts summer. That's pretty late for what we think of. Because meteorologically, June 1st starts summer. We may be seeing 80s, 90 degree weather, or we may be seeing in terms of Celsius, upper 20s to the low 30s degree Celsius. So yeah, it's getting pretty warm by that point, and you would think it's summer, but it's not. So that's where these definitions of the seasons actually come from. <laughs> we can try. Uh, actually, let me just double check that. I think I looked it up one at a time. I just want to see if there's a law around this. Um, launching weather balloons. I would assume there's something. Just because these high altitude weather balloons, um, they may affect aviation. I don't know if there's a law or anything. There's a safety regulations thing here. There are, so there are FAA part 101 High altitude weather balloon flights and nice have two sections. So there are FAA regulations. And also you would probably have to predict the flight, but the uh, we would need to find a meteorologist. We have one now. <laughs> so yeah, we'll have to take a look at this, but there are FAA regulations, especially same thing with like uh, with drones and when you're flying drones over like for sporting events or anything like that, especially in the, uh, the city. But maybe not near an airport. That's definitely a smart decision. But here, we're close enough to Newark Airport that it's still within this regulation spot. Because also, I, I fly drones. I, on my YouTube channel, I have a whole aerial view uh, playlist. And there are restrictions. Even though I live in like the boondocks, there's, in the, I live in the middle of the woods, there are still FAA regulations. And I'm nowhere near an airport. The closest airport is probably about 100 miles away from me. The drones can't go above 400 feet and a whole bunch of things like that. So the FAA, re their restrictions really start at 400 feet and up. That's the FAA airspace, which weather balloons will break that quite a bit. We can get up to maybe 10,000 feet, depending on the weather balloon. But that would be something really interesting to try and find out. And in terms of a live stream, I don't know if we have uh, long range transmitters that can do that. We'll have to find out. Yes, they, they can go up that high, the 120,000 feet, because that's essentially, depending on how much you fill the weather balloon, that can go up all the way to the edge of space. And uh, actually, let me see if I can find a picture. Uh, that's called the thin blue line. Going a little bit more back into the uh, layers of the atmosphere. Thin blue line atmosphere. Just looking at a couple different pictures here. 
This one's upside down. This one's a good one. All right. So once you get high enough, there's literally a thin blue line. And that thin blue line is pretty much the entire atmosphere. It's, in terms of the scale of the Earth, it's that small. It's not really that big. And this is something that is really only seen when you're in like those U2 spy planes because you need to get that high just to see this thin blue line. So this would be a cool shot if we could live stream that, but I don't know if we have enough of a wireless range to uh, actually live stream that, but that would be really cool if we can. Uh, more details to come, I guess, if anybody is interested on that. Definitely uh, comment about that, and we'll see what we can do with that. I don't know how, uh, how much we could do. If anything, we can just launch the weather balloon in the live stream, wait for it to come back down. Then we'll have to collect the footage, and in the next episode, we'll show you the footage from there. So, stay tuned. So that was the Thin Blue Dine. Now there's a couple interesting articles I had up here. Basically this was breaking down astronomical seasons. This is what we're talking about right now. Meteorological seasons. And I tend to, because I'm a meteorologist, it's, it's very subjective, but I tend to go a bit more with the, those meteorological seasons just because it's very easy to know December 1st, March 1st, June 1st, October 1st. Those are all the meteorological start days of the seasons. It might have to be a recorded segment. Yeah, that might be interesting, though. Uh, thank you, Mom Momoville. And I think if we maybe a semi recorded, semi live. We'll have to see how that works, but. Uh, yeah, that would be definitely fun to try and launch the weather balloon. I have done it before with other, with other like, I guess, field trips, you can call it. These were uh, part of a laboratory that I was doing in college where we went out to the National Weather Service. So maybe that's a possibility, too. I don't know anybody at the National Weather Service, but maybe we could take the show on the road and head to one of the uh, National Weather Service offices. One is in uh, Mount Holly. I don't know how far Mount Holly is from here, but maybe. You never know. So that was kind of the uh, definition section of the seasons. Now, why are the seasons changing? I showed you a little example with the golf ball of why this happens and why we have that angle and the sun, the Earth moving around the sun. So. Why are the seasons seemingly changing? Well, there's a couple of reasons that I'm suspecting, and a lot of this that we're going to talk about right now is hypothetical. There's no, there's no research, like hard scientific fact yet for this, but this is something I have been looking into, and something it just by feel, and a lot of other people that I know and talk to, they're saying, yeah, these, some, these spring and fall seasons, they seem to be getting smaller. So we'll talk about why, or one reason why I think. And one of them is because of the climate change. So the idea is global warming, climate change, the world is getting warmer. And the reason we have these differences in zones, for instance, like the equator is always hot, is because the sun is always Pretty much no matter where you are on the hemisphere, the sun is always going to hit somewhere on the equator. And it's always going to be fairly strong there, even though some areas may get stronger depending on exactly the time of the year. Some areas on the equator are pretty hot all year round. So we have hot times all year round. And in the Arctic circles, we have very cold times all year round. There's some areas that the seasons, in the winter season, say in northern Alaska, 
it doesn't even get above freezing for months and months. So above 32 Fahrenheit or above zero Celsius. It could be below freezing for weeks and weeks on end before you even see a little bit above freezing to maybe even a month or two. So we have really cold and we have really hot. And the earth is getting warmer. So we're having both ends, the coldest spot and the warmest spot getting warmer, both of them equally. So I'm thinking if these areas are getting warmer, even though we're talking about especially in the Arctic Circle areas, we're going from maybe negative 10 degrees to 15 degrees. It's still cold and it still feels like negative 15 degrees to positive 15 degrees is feeling like almost the same thing. But that's actually a significant change. And remember I talked about a couple weeks ago, or uh, yeah, it was about this Al Gore series with, I think it was with the Weather Channel, it was six degrees warmer. So even if we just take a little bit there and we go from negative 10 degrees to negative four degrees, we went six degrees warmer. And that stays like that all the time. That'll affect the whole climate. So I'm thinking, because we have these, see, these areas getting warmer, the temperature differences stay the same, or the delta we call it in science. We have those stay the same, just getting warmer. The transition seasons don't have much to transition to. That's kind of the, the whole thing that I'm gonna do a little bit of research on. If we have warm and hot, there's not much of a transition between there versus if we have very, very cold, we have freezing and hot. There needs to be a bigger transition. That's kind of something that I'm wondering, and that's essentially the scientific method. The first step is making a hypothesis. That is my hypothesis that I'm going to conduct some research on. So if we have these areas getting warmer equally between, even though it may not be exactly equally, we have the Arctic circles and the Antarctic circles getting warmer and we have the equator areas getting warmer. That means we may not have as much of a transition. So these transitional seasons get shorter. And we're kind of seeing this now, especially in the Northeast. So it wasn't this week, it was last week. A week from this past Monday, a week ago from the past Monday, it was snowing in some areas not too far north of me, maybe only like 45 minutes north of where I live. It was snowing that Monday. And then the Friday or Thursday, so that was just a few days later, we had record breaking temperatures in the 90s. We went from snow to 90 degree weather in a couple days. That just doesn't happen. <laughs> That's why I'm thinking this, uh, this climate change thing is happening. And this is something, again, where we were talking about where you can't actually take one particular event and say, oh, it's climate change. You can't, there has to be a trend. But we are seeing this trend happening. And with the trend, it's, ten it's trending warm. And as, this is the hypothesis again, there's no scientific evidence yet before this, because we're getting warmer on both ends of the spectrum, that low and the high, we may be having less of this transition. Now, I haven't seen anything in terms of the, the not temperature change of seasons, but the wet and dry seasons. If anybody's watching that lives in one of those climate areas, say like Nepal. Nepal has, it's pretty warm there all year round. It's just always wet or dry. I think um, another one of my friends is actually leaving for a little while to go to Taiwan. I just want to see where their seasons are for wet and dry. So let's see, Taiwan wet season. June to October is the typhoon season in Taiwan. Typhoon, that's a word we haven't used, I don't think at all in the show yet. So if anybody doesn't know the difference between a hurricane and a typhoon, it's essentially um, where they are. Hurricanes are in the eastern Pacific and the Atlantic, kind of where, kind of where the North America and South America are, those areas. Those have hurricanes. 
And once you get to Asia, that's where typhoons happen. And the typhoons are those major storms. That's one way of seeing a typhoon. You have then typhoon season, which are these wet seasons. The monsoons, those are all wet seasonal terms that you could think of from east, right out into Asia or different areas around there. Even, um, even those type of seasons, whether it's wet or dry, may be changing. So the wet season, or the typhoon season, is June to October. And I just want to see, for the heck of it, Ty Taiwan dry season. I typed in dry season, it bring me back to wet. Interesting. So let's see. So 22, this is um, 22 Celsius, which is about a little over 70, 71 degrees Fahrenheit. It typically stays around there for most of this wet season. Let me see. The annual average temperature of the northern part is around 21 Celsius. And some of the coldest months get as low as 10 Celsius, which is about 50 Fahrenheit. Then June to August, temperatures get up to around 38 Celsius, which is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, let's see, average temperature for the rest of the month is about 25 Celsius, so the temperature changes quite a bit there, and that temperature fluctuation happens all the time. It's just the, the biggest season differenti or differentiation that they have are wet and dry. Uh, let's see here. That was a bit more of a travel website, but I think on here that we may be seeing a bit of a difference again totally a hypothesis there's no scientific backing behind this yet this is something some research either i'm going to be doing or somebody else in the meteorological field is going to be doing but even the wet and dry season that is caused by the position of global scale weather phenomenon which is the subtropical high that we talked about in like couple previous episodes that's in say the middle of the Atlantic then you have the Icelandic low low pressure right off the coast of Iceland then you have a couple other areas in the Pacific the Pacific kind of is its own very big high pressure system and all of these areas are the pressure differences are from temperature differences now if we have warmer temperatures and we have less of a uh, temperature difference between the coldest and the hottest, does that mean that we would also see less of a wet and dry season in areas like Taiwan? Maybe. Just because we don't have these blocking patterns that we talked about. So a blocking pattern essentially means we have, say, a high pressure here, and we have a low pressure here, and a low pressure here. We kind of follow this shape around it makes kind of the, the Greek letter omega. Uh, let me see if I can draw it real quick on our little mini Earth. So let's say we have a high pressure and a low and a low. Now remember in the northern hemisphere, the wind flows counterclockwise around a low pressure and clockwise around a high pressure. Opposite when we have the uh, southern hemisphere. Low pressure spins clockwise and high pressure spins counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Didn't really come out too well. Let's see here. Kind of see right there. It kind of looks like that either kind of like a little snakeish. Oh, there we go. There. So it kind of represents with that high and the two lows, and it's flowing this way. So it's flowing from left, going up north, then coming back south, and then coming around the bottom of that low. That is essentially what's called an omega block. So the omega block 
happens here and there. Oh, getting a little bit more centered. There we go. So that's the northern hemisphere. It would be a little bit more opposite. Essentially, for the southern hemisphere, we'll just flip that. Because remember, it's opposite for the southern hemisphere. We're going to have clockwise rotation going around the low pressure system there. And then it goes around the counterclockwise flow around a high pressure, and then it goes back around a clockwise rotation of a low pressure. So it's kind of interesting. You can see just flipping that. Even though it's stationary, drawn on the golf ball there, or drawn on our Earth, that high flips its direction or its spin when we talk about different hemispheres. Something interesting. But that's kind of what I'm thinking. Those blocks, that's what tends to cause these wet and dry seasons. If a block sets up, it could be there for a month, especially in these areas like Taiwan. And that prevents a lot of moisture from coming on in. And when you have this blocking pattern preventing moisture from coming in, you got a lot of dry air. And that means not much rain. You have droughts and stuff like that. Then you have the opposite of the block. The block breaks, moisture comes in, but then the block kind of reforms just in a different spot. And then you have this constant flow of water, essentially moisture coming off the ocean. And when that happens, it's still a blocking pattern, but it's blocked with this onshore flow of moisture. So that's where the wet season comes from. Now, I'm thinking, again, this is a hypothesis, if the high, the really hot area, the high and the low with the temperature is hot and cold, if that temperature dip, that actually goes up with the global warming, so the coldest spot and the warmest spot all go up, say, we'll just say equally for right now, maybe that could change the wet and dry seasons of areas in Asia, just like it's changing the temperature seasons of areas in, say, the U.S., North America, and South America. Well, not everywhere in South America, because they're pretty much on the equator and the Caribbean. The tropics region pretty much stays the same all year round. The temperature changes a little bit, but you really don't see snow happening in Jamaica. It can't happen if you get to really high elevations. Just like in Puerto Rico, there's very mountainy areas on the eastern part of the island. You can see some snow in those really, really high elevations. Jamaica, I don't think, has that much of a high elevation difference. But let me see if I could just find Jamaica snow. Uh, there's a couple of Reddit articles. Let me see here. This is Blue Mountain Peak. I'm just going to take a quick read here. It's the highest mountain in Jamaica, Blue Mountain Peak. And it's 22. Here's a little picture of it if we can show this. So that's Blue Mountain Peak. That's the tallest mountain in Jamaica. And here, I'm just seeing, for both around the world and in the U.S., we have, say, 2250 meters or about 7,500 feet. I'm just seeing, it doesn't say anything about snow in this article. Let me try that Reddit article. Well, they got to be careful, because no matter what they say, everything on Reddit's not always true. Actually, no one responded to this guy. So one response from that was saying, yes, there's been flakes, but it doesn't stick. I could, I could agree with that. I would think that with, especially once you get to those higher elevations, you can have this kind of intermediate area where it may be snowing a little bit, may not be snowing a little bit. 
But either way, it's not going to stick. So essentially, there's no accumulation of snow in Jamaica. So even though there's no accumulation of snow in Jamaica, it still has colder areas. And that doesn't really change too much just because it's in the tropics. When we look at the Earth, the Earth is split up into latitudes. So you have zero at the equator, and it goes up by, say, 20 degrees that, on typical globes that you would see. So 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south. Anything in between there is considered the tropics. So where we are right now, which is in New Jersey, it's about, I think it's 40 degrees north. So this is something called the mid-latitudes. Because if you take this and you kind of make, we're going to go into a little bit of math here, trigonometry. You have zero degrees at the equator. You have 90 degrees at the pole. That makes your perfect right angle. Even though it's not a, the hypotenuse doesn't go straight, it's a bit more of a curve because the Earth is round. Sorry, uh, flat earthers, the Earth is round. We can, we can prove it with a golf ball. We can also prove it. <laughs> this was a funny story with, um, at my other job, we had a very heated and I'd say maybe 10 to 20 minute discussion on this flat Earth theory. I have two examples for anybody that's a flat earther, I'm sorry, but it's just wrong. We have two examples that you can go out and just see that the earth is round. And there's one of the big arguments that we have was, I read in a textbook that the earth is, is round. Do I just believe it? I understand the point is you should question things until you see them. But just to say that you have to throw out everything else because I can't see it, because I can't go up in space, you have to take people's word for it, and that's where it gets a little bit of that gray area. But here's two examples that you can use to prove that the Earth is round. Or I, can, I can even think of three. The Christopher, we'll start with the Christopher Columbus idea. You're standing at the beach, you watch a cargo ship go out, and you can even put, uh, wear, uh, have binoculars and look you'll see what looks like the cargo ship sinking because it's going over the area of the curvature of the Earth. And that's having it go down the other side around that curvature. So that's where we can, first of all, see that the Earth is round. That's where Christopher Columbus first hypothesized that the Earth was round. Number two, a drop of water. If you have a little eyedropper, you drop some little drops, droplets of water, and you watch them go down. What shape are they? They're probably going to be round, if not maybe a little bit of a tail, just because it's turning into a bit more of a teardrop. But initially, before it picks up some velocity, it's going to be round. And that's kind of the same thing you also see when you have the, I forgot what it was called, but you have these long towers. This is kind of how copper BBs are made. You have this long tower, and then you have molten copper that you drip out from the top. And then as it falls, it becomes round because of these natural physics that we, we can research and we can see and calculate. So it makes this round shape. Another example, actually this is, I guess, uh, four examples, you can just even though you could say you could video edit this and you can fake the video. If you watch anybody in the International Space Station with water, the water is just a globe, essentially. It's round, and it's just floating there. That's what the Earth is. The Earth is mostly liquid, or fluid, I should say. Not, the, not from water. Mostly it's molten rock, which is magma. Most of the Earth is a magma. And that's fluid, even though it's gooey, it's still fluid. So that's what makes the Earth may have this naturally round shape. The last example has to deal with the uh, Large Hydron Collider. So now this is about a 10-mile circle around, uh, I think it's somewhere in, I believe, the United Kingdom. Let me just double check exactly where it is. Large Hydron or Hadron Collider. Here it is. So let's see where it is. 
It's, it was built by a European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN. So here's a picture of it. So that's the tube that I'm talking about here. And this tube, it, there's about a circuit that's maybe 10 miles round. And even though this looks pretty straight right here, it is slightly circular, slightly curved. Now, we can't see the curve right here, unless you get really, really far in there. You can start to see some of a curve, but we pretty much can't see a curve. That's the same idea with the Earth. We can't see the curve with our natural vision. But this last example has to do with positioning of those tubes in the Large Hadron Collider. So, and this is something anybody can do is if you have a powerful enough laser. Take a tripod and you take a laser. You mount the laser on the tripod, make sure it's perfectly level, and just shoot the laser beam, say, down a road or somewhere that's pretty straight, pretty open, so nothing blocks the laser. Measure where it is, from, where that laser beam is from the ground. Four miles, or about six kilometers. Go about four miles or six kilometers down. Measure where the laser is again. It's going to be higher off the ground because the Earth is starting to curve away from the laser at that point. So these are some real world examples you can do for this example of the flat earther. Is if you take a piece or just water and you spin it very fast, is it going to make a rectangle? No. It's going to push around the edges of whatever it is and make a bit more of a circle because of something called centripetal force. That's essentially the whole flat earther thing just debunked. But the idea behind it is very scientifically sound of don't just take somebody's word completely for it and try it out yourself. That's what I hope I could uh, also encourage people to do as well is getting into the science field it is something that's really cool. And anybody that finds this interesting, ignore the people that say, oh, you're a nerd, you can't do this. Uh, if anybody watches on YouTube, Casey Neistat, I love his uh, YouTube trailer, Do What You Can't. Somebody says, you're a girl, you can't be a scientist. Do what you can't. You can be a scientist. Or somebody says, you're too fat, you can't run a marathon. Do what you can't. And that actually encourages a lot of people. And they don't prove it just to prove that they can do it. They, pr they do it for themselves because it's a good sense of accomplishment. So that was the whole flat earther thing, essentially. But going back to these seasons and back to my hypothesis. So a couple of different ways I can test this. And this has to deal with uh, years worth. So not just maybe 10 years, but maybe going back 30 years. And 30 years of research may not even be enough. So 30 years passed and maybe taking recordings for the next 30 years. That is starting to get to where we need for climate research. Now, if we get too long, and this is a very fine balance when we're talking about climate change and climate research. If we go back 100 years ago, there were climate records back then. New York City has climate records that go back a very, very far way, back even into the 1800s. And that's really cool to have climate records all the way back into the 1800s. I can look up, say, what's today's date? May 9th, 1898, 1888. I can look these records up. It's really cool to have that. But if we take that and compare them between then and now, it's not really just like um, not an even comparison because of a couple things. Around 19, the 1900s, early 1900s, turn of the century, that's when the Industrial Revolution started. That was kind of the biggest change with climate. So they were burning a lot of coal for these manufacturing plants. There's, uh, I think there's even paintings. Let me see if I can see a painting of London. Turn of the, I'm going to try and search this, turn of the century London. 
Let's see if we have any images. Not the one I was thinking of. This one may. Yes, this works. The Industrial Revolution. So here, I make this a little bit brighter. So this is a pretty good example. All of these are smoke towers. And those smoke towers are pretty much coal burning. And that is not a natural cloud from this painting. That's, all, that's a cloud formed by all of these industrial towers. So this is what I'm thinking is what started the bad climate change. That's what started us down this rabbit hole. When you burn coal, and we talked about the chemical equation, so I'm not going to bore you guys again with this, but when we talked about burning coal, it essentially was taking organic matter, like old fossilized plants, or maybe even in some spots, little old fossilized dinosaurs, but um, I forgot what they're called, but these little bugs and stuff that became fossils, that's where coal actually comes from. And all the fossil fuels are like that too, whether it's natural gas or it's oil, all that is from fossils. So we're basically burning fossils. That's what we're doing with this, which is um, maybe not the best thing to do. And just because of burning fossils, you'd rather research, or I'd rather research fossils. But I also enjoy driving my WRX, and it takes gasoline. So there's a balance there. But turn of the century, that's where it really looked like we started down this rabbit hole. We were burning coal. It was really polluting the atmosphere. And even um, one game that shows it a lot that I'm playing, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. And uh, at the very end of the show, I'll have a little bit of a gaming rig SLI update for you guys. But that game, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, takes place in the Industrial Revolution area in, or era in London. And there are a lot of these towers around. Burning coal, polluting the atmosphere starting then. They, they never really did research on it. There, was, there really wasn't weather forecasting or climate change or any of that. They were just like, oh, burning coal produces heat and, produ and the heat makes water spin or ma heats up water. The steam from the heated water then can turn a turbine. And we have some electricity starting. There's your spark, pun intended, of the Industrial Revolution starting with electricity. Then you also had the uh, cotton gins and stuff like that that was starting to go from manual labor to machine labor from steam or from burning coal or from something. Steam engines burned a lot of coal. We don't really, there are steam engines out there. It's a bit more just for nostalgic reasons or just, I always love trains and I always love seeing the steam engine, but it's not very efficient, it's very dirty. And that soot is basically just carbon, extra carbon that you're adding into the environment, thus making carbon dioxide, because carbon can oxidize or connect with oxygen, O2 in the atmosphere, and you just have C laying around, CO2, there's your carbon dioxide. So that whole era is what I think, again, started us down that rabbit hole, and then it didn't really do too, ba too bad until we got to, I think, the wars, World War I, World War II, all of that using all those fuel and all, that, all the uh, artillery. That really started to change the climate as well. Now, even though I love cars and I love muscle cars, the other big one I could think of is um, with the 70s and 80s, the muscle car era, trying to pump as much gasoline into the engine, not really caring about efficiency. Instead of trying to make the engine more efficient, you were just pumping more gas or shooting more gasoline through the carburetor into the engine to try and get more power out that way. Again, not efficient. It did work. It did create a lot of extra power, but inefficiently, and that created a lot of emissions. And the emissions from a car is just like the emissions from the Industrial Revolution 
coal-burning towers. That was something that we are still doing in a lot of places as well. Just because coal is cheap, what is it, like $5 per ton? Let me just double check that. Coal price. Now, a place where I used to work at a golf course, it was an old uh, trail that they would transport coal from coal mines. And I found about a five pound chunk, it was about the size of my head, of coal. And I thought, oh, this must be worth something. But then I remember I looked and it wasn't much. Um, let's see. Nothing really in pounds, or ki even kilograms I'd take. BTUs, that is short ton. I have no idea what a short ton is. Short ton versus a ton. But this is saying, yeah, I really, I can't find something on this. Short tons. Is anybody familiar with short tons? Because uh, I'm not. I've never actually heard of that before. A short ton. Let's see. The coal price essentially, from what I remember, was about $5 per ton. Which sounds a little odd. Okay. Here's another one. Australia. 85 Australian dollars per metric ton. So let's say 50 to 100 dollars, right? so compensating for Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, US dollars, 50 to 100 dollars per ton. Interesting. It's cheap, you get a lot. That's why we still use coal, just because it's cheap, it burns very well, and it disposes pretty much of itself. When you burn coal, you're left with ash. Ash you can turn in, you just lay on dirt and dirt reabsorbs the ash. And you can also take ash into maybe fertilizer. It helps the fertilizer, you just gonna add stuff to the ash. And you can kind of get a fertilizer. It's a weird thing, it doesn't exactly work the same way, but ash can just become the earth again. So it's cheap. That's number one. Number two, it disposes of itself very easily. And number three, it, it produces a good amount of heat. Those are three big reasons why we still use coal. And coal, starting from those industrial revolution times, and all the way through now, it really has an effect. So when we're trying to define these seasons, and we're trying to look at the future, the times then, late 1800s to the early 1900s to, let's say up to the 2100, years 2100, it's gonna be very different, especially if we get this electric trend. This is something I would really like, the electric trend. Even though you gotta be careful, you could still have a Tesla Motors electric vehicle that's running on coal, because coal is charging the battery. Coal power is charging the battery. There's electricity, I've said this a couple times, but it's something I like to repeat just because it takes a little while to just sink in. Um, electricity is not an energy source. Electricity is an energy carrier. And batteries store the electrical charge. So batteries store energy, store the energy that's traveling through the electricity. They're not an energy source. You can have a coal burning power plant that creates electricity and sends it out. That's carrying that energy in the form of electricity into the Tesla car and stores it in the battery. And you're not really helping that, even though, don't get me wrong, I would love to drive a Tesla and try and feel that instant surge of torque, but um, you gotta be careful where your source is. And one thing I'm looking at too is solar is I just bought a house last year and you know, a lot of sun all year round and I'm trying to look at solar panels that are going on the roof 
Because even though it's a big investment up front, and there was another person I watch on YouTube, his name, uh, the YouTube channel is Paul's Hardware. He just is getting solar panels put on his roof. He's in Southern California, sunny Southern California, so there's a lot of sun there. And he also had a uh, Tesla Powerwall, which essentially is a giant battery pack that's probably as high as half of the studio of just a battery bank that sits on the outside of his house. So at night when there's no sun to charge the solar panels and either the power goes out or something happens where the lines get cut, the house actually switches over to running from the Tesla Powerwall battery, which is something that's a little bit interesting. So if you're taking these the solar panel or you have a solar panel on your house and you're running your house off of solar energy, that's what you're using to charge your car your Tesla car, any kind of electric car, then you're helping because you're not relying on coal or oil, burning oil. That is something that I'm thinking may be turning into the future a little bit. Even there's a new spot that's like two miles away from, or two and a half miles, almost three miles, I guess, from where I live that I just saw it unveiled and they had kind of like a ribbon cutting of a bank of about 10 supercharged stations for, for Tesla. I think it was just for Tesla, but I'm pretty sure those, and at the New York International Auto Show when I was there, those cables, they're pretty thick if you ever went to the electric car section. I was, I was shocked with how big and thick those cables were, but I shouldn't have been shocked just because I'm thinking there's a lot of current going through and you need a lot of amps, and when you need a lot of amps, you need thick wires. So that's kind of where we need to go with climate change. But I'm also thinking that starting from the Industrial Revolution, that's kind of where we started to see climate changes happening, even though they weren't actually recorded. So now, one of the big hurricanes, I think it was not oral. Ophelia, it was, a it was in the 1930s. Let me just see if I can find it real quick here. Or was it Camille? That might be ringing a bell. Let me just try Hurricane, not Hurricane, <laughs> Hurricane Camille. I just want to see when that was. 1969, okay, not as far back as I was thinking. But Hurricane Camille was an interesting hurricane. But starting in the 30s, essentially, there was a big hurricane that came through that, at the time, they didn't even think could happen. So that's where I'm thinking. Also, this is, again, a hypothesis, that starting then, that's where we're... That's where climate change kind of started to rear its ugly head. And then from there, we had these major hurricanes. And now, again, going off of trends, this is where we're seeing we have three major hurricanes at the end of last year. That has not happened in a while. We had that in 2015, and I had a weird picture sent from me from a viewer that was uh, comparing three hurricanes in 2015 to the three hurricanes in... 2017, and they were, oddly enough, the same letters. I-J-K, was it? Katia, that was another one. I-J-K, so it was Irma Jose Katia last year. And I forgot what they were in 2015, but these three letters and the, the position was like almost identical. So within the past, let's, let's say the same decade from 2010 to now, we're seeing a lot more of these major storms. Why? The world's getting warmer. And when we were talking about how seasons are changing and all that, the transitionary seasons, spring and fall, that's because, especially when we're talking about fall, and the peak of hurricane season really happens later in the summer is still, we're in summer technically until about, say, September 21st. And with that, 
hurricane season kind of peaks late August going through mid-September just because the heat of the summer is trying to be dissipated. Remember, Mother Nature loves to have equilibrium. And when Mother Nature tries to balance out the heat of the summer, the only way to really dissipate heat is to stir up the atmosphere. When you're stirring up the atmosphere, you need a hurricane. So hurricanes are created from this ex excess heat. The more heat, the stronger the storms, the more storms happen. So it's kind of all correlating. So my whole thing with climate change was you can't just take one single event and say that's climate change. That's bad science. Climate change you can't say exists just because of that. But the trend, the trend is you have a lot of these major hurricanes coming. And I just want to see if the National Hurricane Center put out anything for this year. 2018, no, not 2080, 2018 hurricane season. I just want to see if there's any kind of an outlook. So someone still talk about Irma from 2018, which didn't happen. There's some CBS videos on what to expect with 2018. I'm just trying to see if there's something from the uh, National Hurricane Center. All right, this one is for, it's an article from NPR. 2018 hurricane season will bring another battery of storms. So, if these forecasts actually come true, or what we call validate. <laughs> That, that could be bad, especially because Puerto Rico, and I have family in Puerto Rico, and they're still struggling. Essentially, uh, my grandfather, Abuelo, I kind of separate the sides of the family, my Italian side and my Puerto Rican side, from calling Grandma, Grandpa, Abuelo, Abuela. So on the Puerto Rican side, my Abuelo, he owned a farm and basically sold the farm, sold the house with this, or is trying to, because it was destroyed. I was, a, I was able to say I think I had an ox in my family until the ox was killed by Hurricane Maria. Um, th it's devastating and there's, it's starting to get better but it's, there's still struggles in Puerto Rico. And the other, there's another island. One of my friends got engaged during this hurricane season time and the spot where he proposed it was, uh, it was a beautiful site. You had the sunset going, and you had all the uh, workers there from the, the hotel area. They actually took the picture of him proposing to his girlfriend. And after the hurricanes came through, they sent him another picture, and that same exact spot that he proposed was underwater. And there was trees and cars floating over the spot. So, climate change is deadly. Now, say what you want about politics and climate change. Maybe I'll even have an episode of politics and climate change. I, I try not to talk about politics too much, but if you guys are interested, I'll definitely, um, I'll definitely uh, let you know. Maybe we'll do that. But essentially, politics and Trump pulling us out of the uh, Paris Climate Accord either is a sign that he doesn't care or it's a sign that he's just incompetent. Say what you want about that, but it's happening. Climate change is deadly, and whether it's being underplayed or downplayed, I guess you could say, or what, it, it's happening, and it's deadly. People died in these hurricanes that happened through the Caribbean. Um, I think it was St. John. Let me just see. St. John Island. It was a spot near where I like to go to a vacation. They actually let us know, if you're going to this island, don't. There's nothing there. It's part of the U.S. Virgin Islands. So... Essentially, that whole area, the U.S. Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, it was destroyed. So it is deadly, and it is something that we need to take a look at, which is why I decided to 
start this with climate talk, so we just get the word out there. And with these hurricanes that came through, and from what this article in NPR was saying, I think I just closed it, <laughs> we may be ha in for another pretty bad hurricane season. And also has to rate a little bit what we started the show with, which is El Nino and La Nina. Uh, we're in this neutral phase right now. And staying in the neutral phase doesn't really have this blocking that we also talked about. So a lot of things can just sprout up. And um, that has a bit of a uh, concern, I guess, I can have with that. Uh, Actually, I did close it. Let me see if I can just bring it up. There's one more thing I wanted to read from there. 2018 hurricane season. Oh, also, an interesting fun fact. The um, names of all of the hurricanes in the Pacific and the Atlantic, they are predetermined until five or ten years. I think it's out until 2022 right now. So about five years, let's say, we have the names of all the hurricanes possible. And also, after I just try and find this, I'll, I'll go through like um, how that naming scheme works. Um, there's also something starting already. It's called invests, is what they call them to start out with. Where did that NPR article go? Oh, I lost it now. Tampa Bay, Newsweek. Weather Underground. Oh, this is another website I like, is um, HowStuffWorks.com. Scientists predict record-breaking 2018 season. The image I don't think is, uh, it is real. So let's pull this up. So the caption essentially reads here, satellite from NOAA tropical storm Ophelia nears Florida. So that's Ophelia. As Hurricane Nate is in the middle and then, or center it's saying to the right, Maria. So the odd thing, again, it's alphabetical. O, which you would think P comes next. We had Nate. So there, and Maria. So the alphabet's out of order just because Maria stuck around quite a bit. And it spun here in the Atlantic and gathered its strength until it started to make this charge toward the Caribbean islands. And that's where it pretty much went straight for uh, Puerto Rico. And even in the northeast U.S., this is um, kind of where we saw a little bit of an effect for that. Uh, we can switch back to the main camera. But we saw a little bit of the effect, and this is something I was doing a, a little bit of a research project in when I was interning at CBS. It was following the tracks of these hurricanes in relation to Puerto Rico. And essentially, if it went too south of Puerto Rico, it didn't catch enough of the subtropical high, and it was heading straight into the Gulf of Mexico, which Hurricane Katrina that's the path it took. It went south of Puerto Rico, and then it went out through Florida, then into the Gulf of Mexico, and then went up into New Orleans. So that was south of Puerto Rico. Ones that go north of Puerto Rico, they are a bit too much into that subtropical high, and then they go what we call OTS, or out to sea. It caught the subtropical high too much, and that just pulled it out to sea. The ones that go right over Puerto Rico, those are the ones that tend to follow the curve of the East Coast, going from Florida, following the East Coast United States, up and out of the area through, say, the New southern New England, once we get into, say, Connecticut and Massachusetts there. Interesting theory. I, ha I haven't done actually research on that since, which was probably about what, 20, 2012, 2013. So I'll have to get back up on that, but that's something interesting I'd like to take a look at again. But 2018 predicts record-breaking hurricane season. 
even though 2017 wasn't the warmest on record, the overall average temperatures are trending upward. So when we take a look at a graph, we could say we have a data point there, there's a temperature, there's temperature. And we had these peaks right up at the top. That was 2015 and 2016, and 2017 went down a little bit. But still, this is warmer than here. So we're trending upward, again, which this is all climate change. Uh, just seeing your comment there a few weeks ago about Russia developing a nuclear torpedo that caused a tsunami. That I didn't. Again, <laughs> that's um, a little bit going into last week's topic, which we could do a little recap of last week's topic now, which was um, weather and war. That may be going into the part of the conversation we were having, which was weather modification, which... Um, Star Trek came into there. I actually don't think I showed the Star Trek article. Weather control system. Here we go. Weather modification system. Yeah, that's what it was called. Weather modification weather control system was a system used to alter the natural weather patterns of a planet. So, We'll see how true this is. The article actually says this is from the year 2369. We'll see. Mark that on your calendar. 2369 will be controlling the weather. So you can go out into your uh, iCal or whatever and put that down. <laughs> That's a joke. But um, weather modification, maybe not to the extent that Star Trek had it, but it happens. And... The nuclear torpedo that caused a tsunami can kind of go into that. The other one we talked about last week was this, what my, uh, my uncle's going through right now, which is he was in Vietnam, and Vietnam used something called Agent Orange to do what's called deforestation. Essentially, the Viet Cong was so difficult to defeat because they were deeply entrenched in these uh, holes and these underground tunnels throughout the forest that the military operations, and I actually talked with somebody else last week, and we, we said this was just mistakes, that, mistakes of war. Um, essentially, the idea was, well, if we can't get these Viet Cong out from hiding in the forest and, or hiding in the jungle and all these holes, uh, why don't we get rid of the forest? It's kind of the same thing going into medicine. Uh, antibiotics essentially kill all bacteria, even though... Our digestive system requires bacteria. Do you have good bacteria? The probiotics is where you may have heard that. In your digestive system right now that are good, and they may be part of your immune system that are fighting out bad bacteria. And when you're really sick and you take antibiotics, it kills the good bacteria as well. So that's kind of the same mentality that we have with war in Vietnam, even though Vietnam technically was a conflict. Um, Getting rid of the forest made it easier to defeat the Viet Cong. They used a couple of things. This Agent Orange essentially killed off the trees. And another one was the flamethrower, just burning down the forest. Basically, um, we brought hell on Earth there. The, uh, I think it was mostly the U.S., but we brought hell on Earth. And bad decisions. That was starting to get into weather modification, too, because when you get rid of a whole jungle... Uh, you change the climate because that had to do with the CO2 balances. So that had to do with something. But recently, this uh, nuclear torpedo, let me see if I can even find that article. How uh, was it? Let's see, Russia. What was it? Torpedo, was it? Tsunami. So this is from, the first one that comes up is from Slate. Pentagon says Russia is building nuclear torpedo described as doomsday weapon. I hope not. <laughs> I would like to live my life to the fullest without dying within the next decade. But I 
hope not. <laughs> but another interesting thing was uh, harp. Let's see if I could bring that up again. Is it A A R? It was like A A R P, but with an H in front. High frequency active auroral research program. Now this is getting into a bit of science, really sci-fi stuff that's coming into fruition right now. Uh, there's these satellite dishes that are it's based out of Alaska, and they shoot radio waves or call essentially microwaves into the atmosphere, and they're microwaving the atmosphere. They're taking the atmosphere and putting that into a microwave oven. I don't know how good that is because when you do that, what basically how a microwave oven works, you put something in there, the frequency that the microwaves hit the food that you put in the microwave oven, excite the water and start the water molecules vibrating. And when you get a lot of things vibrating and rubbing together, it heats up. So that's how it heats the food is basically you're taking water and heating it up. That's also why when you put, say put bread in, you try and heat it up or even hot dogs, or, uh, not really hot dog, but more sausage, and you put it in there and you leave it in too long, it just dries out because all the moisture is evaporated. That's kind of what could happen in the atmosphere. If you use this <laughs> in the wrong way and you're microwaving part of the atmosphere, you'll dry out that part of the atmosphere so much that you would change the climate or the, the global wind patterns. The other idea with that, and again, it's a little bit of a conspiracy theory, is you're heating one part of the atmosphere to steer hurricanes, which China did to steer Hurricane Katrina into the US. I bring that up, I don't believe it at all. I just thought it was funny. Just because I don't think that actually can happen just yet without dire consequences to the rest of the atmosphere. Uh, also, there was a, one article I read that I brought up last week was these nanomachines. Now, for those that um, will follow nanomachines, essentially, what happened there is these nanomachines, tiny little things you can't see, they are machines, they are used in cloud seeding. And these machine, these little nanomachines start to accumulate little droplets of water and they form a cloud, a lot of them. And essentially you have a robotic cloud. You have a cloud you can control and that can be weaponized. And when you weaponize a cloud to make a thunderstorm, that can be either used to create a lot of rain in some areas where it would totally flood out one region, which also actually happened in Vietnam. They used cloud seeding, regular cloud seeding that we think of over the open plains, for instance. And they used the cloud seeding to make it rain much more. So it was in the wet season when we talked about wet and dry season. It was in the wet season they made it rain so much that it flooded the Viet Cong out of those areas. And it, that was one way we used weather to affect war. We, we, used, we weaponized weather. That is something that could happen again with these nanomachines, especially if you're cr controlling a cloud. Now, when you create thunderstorms, and this is really going into the future, maybe by that year, what was it, 20, 2369 or something from Star Trek? But if you're controlling a cloud and you have a bunch of these clouds with nanomachines, essentially that's a hurricane. You have globs of thunderstorms going around and they start spinning around each other and that starts to create the eye wall of a hurricane. So it's not, it's not too far of a stretch of the imagination to take a cloud that you control with nanomachines into a hurricane and then you can steer the hurricane into different areas. It's something that's really freaky and it's really scary and I don't hope, I hope it doesn't actually happen because if we are at the level that we can create hurricanes and we can control where the hurricanes go, we, we have almost become God at that point because we can just control what the planet does. That's... Uh, that, I think, is a little bit too much power. Also, with the whole nuclear thing, and I don't know if anybody follows, the uh, Iran nuclear deal is basically dead now. And since the Iran nuclear deal is dead, 
that basically removed all the restrictions and Iran const or Iran like Iraq ear Iraq or that was how, yeah Iran Iraq I Iraq they um they can start building nuclear weapons again now nuclear weapons in the climate that is completely devastating because if you see if you've ever seen the World War II footage of Nagasaki and Hiroshima those clouds were really tall those clouds towered over the airplanes that dropped the bombs that is total atmospheric change right there from the ground all the way up to the top of the troposphere maybe even I don't even think maybe it did maybe it broke into the stratosphere because remember 99% of weather happens in the bottom layer the troposphere it's really hard to get into that next layer but I think these nuclear bomb the uh, the mushroom clouds may have broken that boundary and gone into the next level so if we start this nuclear warfare it um will change the climate drastically like in the blink of an eye and uh what was it war games i think was the movie with uh, matthew broderick i think it was No, I don't think it's Matthew Broderick. Oh, yeah, it was. The film stars Matthew Broderick. What year did this come out? 1983. So the idea with that was uh, it was a simulation. But the AI, the artificial intelligent computer system, tricked the U.S. military into thinking Russia, because this, this was kind of still during the Soviet Union Cold War era, it tricked the U.S. military into thinking that uh, the Soviet Union launched nuclear missiles. And they almost launched back real nuclear missiles. So the U.S., I mean. Essentially, this went through a bunch of computer simulations. And it was trying to figure out what the best scenario was. So if the U.S. launched a nuclear missile into the Soviet Union first, then they would respond, and they would respond with, their allies and then once that happened the allies of the US would respond and all these nuclear weapons I think it was doing like 20 or 30 nuclear bombs went off around the globe at the same time or roughly around the same time because they all get fired off in different areas uh, the client everyone died <laughs> so this is on the level when we also talk about we had the movie ep the movie episode of uh, climate matters the movie The Day After Tomorrow had climate change happen in three days, but essentially the day after tomorrow, today, tomorrow, and then the day after tomorrow. That would be the level of destruction that would happen if we had this intercontinental nuclear warfare. Uh, well, I don't know. Me uh, Meko, hello. Well, what do you want me to repeat which part of it? The, tar the part with the, um, the nuclear weapons? Or the part about the movies? Or a different part that I wasn't sure about. <laughs> but um, essentially, that game, everything? <laughs> uh, well, once the uh, episode concludes, then we can go back. Because we don't have that much time. Maybe uh, about 14, 13 minutes left. Something like that. But essentially, we're just wrapping up now. But thank you for joining. And the idea and the whole theme of this was um, the seasons. We were talking about the seasons as a whole, and I had a little golf ball that I represented as the Earth. Uh, yes, I'll, the gaming computer front. Yep. Let me get to that in one second, but just the whole recap. The seasons, you have a couple different definitions. You have the idea that you have specific dates the meteorological starts December 1st, March 1st, June 1st, October 1st. And then you have the astronomical days, which can vary from time to time. But the seasons, I think, are changing, especially those transitional ones, which are spring and fall, which you had the cold of winter, and then you had the, hot, the heat of summer. And then you, they transition between each other, and that little transitionary period is spring and fall. They're shrinking, and my hypothesis with that, which again, I gotta do a little bit of research on it, 
is because you have the coldest spot and the hottest spot. Both of those are getting warmer. The temperature difference may be staying the same, but they're all getting hotter. And that may be because of the whole climate change thing. And if that is the case, then the temperature differences may not have that much of a transition to go through. So these spring and fall times may not exist anymore. That's why not this week, but the week before, it was snowing on Monday and it was 90 degrees on Thursday. Uh, yes, I do I have a Bachelor of Science degree in meteorology, so I'm a professional meteorologist. I am on television too, if you ever watch, or if you're in the tri-state region, Verizon Fios. But um, that's essentially the gist of this episode that we're talking about, a couple different things. And then for the last little bit, especially going off war games, video games, and then we were talking about, uh, thank you, I, uh, I try to make the whole thing a little bit cool science is what I try and do. No pun intended there with the cool and the weather. Ha, ah, what a joke. But um, on the gaming front now, so this has been going on the past couple of weeks. I had a gaming computer I built in 2016, and I just upgraded or wanted to upgrade it to SLI. I had a GTX 1080 in there. And I wanted to add a second 1080 to do a SLI of two 1080s. I had the original card, which is um, the Founders Edition, it was called. I added a liquid cooler on it, but it was still essentially the PCB or the, the board, the printed the circuit board of the Founders Edition card. Then I bought a second GTX 1080. Also, uh, both of these were from EVGA that were um, the liquid cooler and just the card itself. I put that in, and they were different heights. So. The uh, EVGA card was about here, and the Founders Edition card was here, and then the bridge just wouldn't fit. So that was an issue I had. Then I did a live stream on my uh, YouTube channel, where uh, it was about Sunday night, not this past Sunday, but two Sundays ago. I did the upgrade of remove, and I had to change the power supply, too, because adding a second new graphics card in needed, means I needed to add more power connectors. I needed two power connectors per card, and I only had three total for the system. So I started by removing all the graphics cards, put the power supply, or remove the old power supply, put a new power supply in, took out the old Founders Edition card, and put these two matching cards in. And that was where I ended the stream. They were just installed, didn't turn it on. It was almost midnight at that point, so I pretty much ended there. Then, next day I try and start it. SLI is not an option. I was like, why? The bridge is on. I actually had a bridge that worked. It wasn't the, uh, the high bandwidth bridge, which is these very wide bridges. It was the one that came with the motherboard. So I wasn't sure if that would be it. But from what I read, those regular low bandwidth bridges would work. Nothing showed up. Then I re uh, did more research. The processor I had, which was a 6700K, uh, it has 16 PCI Express lanes. Those 16 lanes are taken up by the two graphics cards in SLI, 8 and 8. I also had a Wi-Fi card in there. So essentially it was 8 for the top card, 4 for the Wi-Fi card, 4 for the second graphics card. Didn't work. Pulled out the Wi-Fi card, back to 8 and 8. Still didn't work. It was also because I had it in the wrong slot. The particular motherboard I had needed the slot, the, the graphics card for SLI in slot 1 and 3. For spacing reasons, to try and get more airflow, I did slot 1 and slot 4. Four. It didn't like that. So then I moved the second graphics card up to the third slot from the fourth slot, and then that's when I started to add that low bandwidth bridge, and it worked. SLI turned on, but it was still a little bit wonky because it used that low bandwidth bridge, and then I had to order another high bandwidth bridge, which came. I tried that, and I have seen a great improvement. Not every game has as big of an improvement as other games, but overall, it is an improvement. There's one game I like to play in particular. Yes, I did want to do this. It's a monitor. It's a 4K60 monitor. What I wanted to try and see, which actually SLI 1080s are not enough, and it, I'm not going to upgrade to 1080 Ti's, but this is what's needed when you SLI 1080 Ti's, which is 4K 144 hertz. That's what we were trying to go. I have a friend that we were building computers together, and we can't believe that we bought our graphics cards and built their systems two years ago already. 
the uh, 10 series NVIDIA cards have been out two years, which is like, it, it flew by. Though, yes, those monitors are expensive, and we couldn't afford them. The monitor I have, the 4K60, was only about 350, which was kind of around the price range of the television of about the same size, which is what, 24 inches? It is uh, Acer. Acer is the brand of monitor that I have. So 4K60 Acer monitor, and now I have two GTX 1080s in SLI, and they're running pretty much every game at 4K, except a few, at or above 60 frames. Like, the last game I was playing was Doom from 2016, and I was getting 90 to 100 frames per second at 4K with ultra settings throughout the whole game, which was really cool. Then another game I was playing, which I mentioned before, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which was that Industrial Revolution era uh, Assassin's Creed game. Uh, I tried 4K, and it wouldn't really get above 40 on there. Not because of the graphical stuff, but also because that's open world. Open world games take up a lot more because you have the whole map, and you have people in every part of the map. Even though you might be here on the map, there's people up here, and it needs to render all those in real time. So those you need to run at lower resolutions. So I'm running that at 1440, and when I'm running it at 1440, I'm getting about 60 to 70 frames, sometimes a little bit over 70 frames per second, which is comfortable. And the detail still look, is on ultra in 1440, so it's not as high resolution, but the detail is still there and looks really nice. Even though it didn't hit 60, 40 wasn't terrible. There was a bit more of um, screen tearing so if anybody's not sure, screen tearing means when you're, especially when you're doing fast movement, you actually see what looks like splits or lines going down the screen because the, screen, the refresh rate of the monitor is different than the refresh rate of the graphics card. That's where something like FreeSync from uh, AMD or G-Sync from NVIDIA matches the monitor to the graphics card so you kind of eliminate that screen tearing issue. So. That was where I was. I have a 4K non-G-Sync monitor that runs at 60, and most of the games I can run at 60. Like, um, even though this game's kind of losing its, uh, its appeal to me, Watch Dogs 2 I have, that one's running well over 60. It doesn't show me specifically, but just by my eye, I can see it's over 60. And is that running at 4K? High details, some ultra detail. I don't think it does ultra, but the, the higher details of that game, and yeah, it runs fine. So overall, the SLI mission was accomplished. Witcher 3, I have not played. Witcher 3 is something I may be going down the road and getting, but uh, there's another one, because I also run VR. I have an Oculus Rift, and there was one demo, I guess you would call it. It was NVIDIA Funhouse. When I was running it at the highest settings in VR, my virtual hands were stuttering. And they were, kind of, they were just stuttering and shaking because the graphics card wasn't able to keep up with the VR output. You played it on the Vive, okay. So yeah, playing it on the Vive I've never done. I've actually never even touched the Vive. But I had the Rift just because it was a cheaper package at the time when I got the Black Friday deal. And playing it on the Rift, it's not terrible. I had to buy the third sensor because to get the 3D tracking, because the Vive seems to be a bit better at tracking. To buy, I had to buy the third sensor for the tr 3D tracking to get the equivalent of what comes out of the box with the Vive. But it still ended up being about the same price, so not a terrible decision. Also, not just Windows gaming computer, but I also have lots of Macs. The Vive works with VR gaming on the Mac. Say what you want about that, but it actually works. And also, in doing video editing with 360 video, you can wear the Vive headset connected to the MacBook Pro or an iMac with those lighthouses for the Vive already set up. And you can be watching around this 360 video with the headset while you're editing the video. Kind of a cool thing. But that was something where... I was making a decision between the Vive and the Rift, and I went with Rift just because at that time for Black Friday last year was cheaper. But overall, it seems to be working a bit better having the Rift 
with this SLI setup versus non-SLI. It's smoother and also you really want high frame rates. You want 90 frames per second or more for running any kind of virtual reality because you want to eliminate all the, the motion sickness kind of thing, which I haven't had. It's a, it's a great thing, especially virtual reality. Now, anybody else watching, in the Be Terrific here, we, we're starting to get a green screen studio up. It's, I guess, almost finished. I haven't seen it actually yet. It's, a, well, it's, it's here, but having that green screen, being able to put or output the VR headset view onto the green screen, I've seen that before. And I've seen that on YouTubes and live streams, but I would love to actually try it. So something I would try at home, but the capture cards and a couple of different things. Uh, and this is the last thought before we end the show, but the capture cards and stuff, especially when you plug in, I'm not sure how the, the Vive handles it, but with the Rift, when you plug in the Rift HDMI into a splitter, the Rift just does not like that. It doesn't work. I'm not sure how the Vive works with the HDMI splitters, but essentially what I'm going to try next is um, basically a camera on a little, I have a little Manfrotto tripod called the Pixie that's about this high, sits on my desk pointing straight at the computer screen. That would work, because then I could stream off of that phone and capture that as my green screen background. So that may work. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining. This pretty much wraps up the show for this week. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you have any more questions or comments, definitely leave them in the chat. We'll see if we can answer them later on, maybe going into next week. Also, next week, I'm not exactly sure what topic I'm gonna choose. I have a couple different topics to choose from, but I'm definitely gonna try and bring my friend Stanley, who is pretty big on YouTube, got like 20,000 subscribers. We'll see if he can come on in. So this is meteorologist Andrew Panero with the, this episode of Climate Matters. Remember to have a great evening, everybody, and definitely stay and be terrific.